most of our sites have our black hymnal this evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Forest Hills Baptist Church here in Titusville, Florida, this third day of December, 2023. We're worshiping our Lord Jesus out of our hymns of grace, the black hymnal tonight. If you'd like, take your hymnal, please, and stand. We'll sing number 223, 223. may be seated and turn to number 229, 229.
firstborn Noel. Sing we Noel's mass, sing we now Noel. In the skull they found him, Joseph and Mary mild, seated round the manger, watching the holy child. Sing Gold and myrrh they took their gifts of greatest price. There was there a stable, so like paradise. Sing we Noel, the King is born Noel. Sing we now of Christmas, sing Turn we now in Trinity hymnal to the London Baptist Confession of Faith. We're reading straight through as the Lord gives us the time and the opportunity. The London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. We're in chapter 23. <clears throat> chapter 23 of lawful oaths and vows. I have it in my copy of the Trinity Hymnal on page 682, 683. 682, 683, page 683, chapter 23, paragraphs 4 and 5. Paragraph 4. An oath is to be taken in the plain and common sense of the words, without equivocation or mental reservation. That's right. <laughs> Paragraph 5. A vow which is not to be made to any creature, but to God alone, is to be made and performed with all religious care and faithfulness. But popish monastical vows of perpetual single life, professed poverty, and regular obedience are so far from being degrees of higher perfection that they are superstitious and sinful snares in which no Christian may entangle himself. And that finishes up chapter 23 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. Now before the preaching this evening, let's sing from our black hymnal number 220. 220. Is it 250? Yeah, 250. 250. Sorry about that. 250. Let's 
story, tidings of a gospel true, thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praises voicing, greet the morrow, Christ the babe was born for you, Christ the babe was born for you. song that David wrote and the first half of David's song that we looked at several weeks ago, praise God for his deliverances by rejoicing in God as the rock of his salvation. Uh, David then sang about the mighty ways by which God had saved him from his enemies and he concluded by stating that this was in response to his life of faith and obedience. The second half of this song goes back over these same themes, only in the opposite order. David celebrates God's faithfulness in dealing with people. He rejoices in what God empowered him to do, and he praises God as the rock of salvation once again. Verse 47 of chapter 22 says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation, which is the general theme of this whole song. This song is a repetition of song number eight, uh, 18, and they're almost verbatim. Uh, we concluded last time that the one written here was kind of for David, and then later on when they put the psalms together, they kind of cleaned it up a little bit and made it for public reading. And I kind of go along with that theory. Uh, going back, at least as far as Augustine, Christian commentators have talked about how David's song virtually repeats uh, Psalm 18 and can be fully explained only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ. If we don't see Christ in Psalm 18 and if we don't see Christ in this song, then we miss the boat. Uh, one such commentator, he's not a famous guy, his name is Arno C. Uh, Gavlian, uh, he wrote this, and it kind of sums it up. We find utterances and experience here which cannot be matched in David's life. The true anointed one of God, Christ our Savior, in his sufferings and the deliverance from above, as well as his exaltation and his coming kingdom, constitute the deeper prophetic meaning of this great inspired hymn. And so we need to have that constantly in the back of our mind because sometimes David's talking about him and he's really talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the second half of David's song starts with his continuing to explain why God saved him. Back in verse 21, he had said, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. Now you recall when we looked at that verse, uh, we said that David was not claiming to be justified by his works as if he had never sinned. Rather, he was contending that his life had, generally speaking, been an obedient life with the saving help of God. In a similar way, Martin Luther might accurately have concluded his life by stating that he had never strayed from the principles of the Reformation and that he had always preached the true gospel. This was true of Luther, as it should be of any true preacher today, with the result being that God blessed his ministry in a mighty way. And so it was for David. Beginning in verse 26 tonight, David reflects on God's actions in terms of a principle that applies to everyone. In verses 21 through 25, he describes what God did for him. Now he speaks to God, to God about how he acts. Verses 26. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the forward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. 
So here David's talking about the principle that God, while unchanging in and of himself, he responds to men and women differently according to their response to him. Primarily, David wants us to understand that God will be true to us if we commit ourselves to him in faith. Those who want to be faithful to God's word will find that he too is true to it, and that should be a great encouragement to us as well. This isn't to say that those who trust in God will never experience difficulties. We've taught this over and over again. David's life testifies to the many trials and suffering that the godly must endure, some as a result of their sinfulness and others because of their godly living. The word for merciful is kashin, which denotes covenant faithfulness, loving kindness. So those who faithfully embrace the principle of God's covenant will find that God will keep his covenant with them. Likewise, the man who lives in innocence toward others will find no blame in God toward him. The pure, the sincere believer will discover the purity of God's will for his life. But the same principle holds true for those who lead an opposite kind of life. Verse 27 says, with the froward, thou wilt show thyself unfavorably. I looked up these two Hebrew words. Froward, ikashi, means twisted, distorted, crooked. So with the twisted, torted, uh, these, two, these twisted, distorted people, he's going to show himself unsavory. Unsavory as pothal, which means to twist or to be twisted. And so this verse is literally saying that God is twisted in response to the twisted, crooked person. Of course, scholars have some difficulty with this. The point, of course, is that some kind of treatment we saw in response to the godly, David doesn't mean that God is unfair or dishonest with the ungodly, but rather those who refuse to walk the straight line or they choose to walk a twisted line, God will find that he's going to make their paths crooked and twisted as well. God must have a different purpose with the wicked than he does with the godly. And so that's what this verse is teaching us. Now it's obvious to David that the qualities he mentions are taken seriously by God. One of the virtues that God loves is humility. And therefore David wrote in verse 28, and the afflicted people wilt thou save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty that thou mayest bring them down. So the afflicted are the opposite of the haughty. These are the humble, the afflicted. And here's the prideful people over here that are being contrasted. And the idea is that those who have been so afflicted as to have no other hope than in God himself will find that God is faithful to save them. Meanwhile, those such as King Saul, who rose to the point so high that, they for, that he forgot about God, they are inevitably, inevitably brought down in their foolish arrogance, as we saw in the case of King Saul. In all these ways, David is singing, the word of the Lord is tried, in verse 31. So while God's unwavering faithfulness cuts both ways, for the godly and against the ungodly, David's main point here is highlighting how he has been blessed by God. Verse 29, for thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. You recall in the tabernacle, the priest kept the golden lampstand always shining. And this symbolized what David experienced by trusting in God. As a result of the Lord's faithful care, David's light was never snuffed out. In the darkest times of his life, the Lord was a light to whom he could turn to whenever, and he did that time and time again. Those of you who have read J.R.R. Tolkien, he wrote The Lord of the Rings. In his trilogy, he wrote about when the small and weak heroes named Frodo and Samwise, they wanted to pass through the utter darkness of the giant spider Shelob's lair. When all was dark and there seemed no way to go safely forward, Samwise remembered the star glass given to Frodo by the princess Galadriel. 
She said, may it be a light to you in dark places when other lights go out. And so when Samwise held out the star glass and she loves it lighter, it light, it, it light, the light both reflected or deflected the evil and it enabled them to see their way through safety in that dark place. David didn't need any fantasy magical light and neither do we. When we remember the Lord's promises, turning to him in prayer and looking to his word for guidance, he is the light that puts out the darkness and leads us to safety. His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. So in addition, David had learned that the Lord, he is a buckler to all them that trust in him. Now a buckler is a shield. The word of the Lord is tried, he says, using the, a word that elsewhere speaks of the proving of metals to show that there's no mixture. The dross has been burned off and it has been tried. And that's the same word he uses here. God's word, he is saying, is the genuine article. It's real, saving truth. And David had learned to guard his heart and life by using this mighty shield, this mighty buckler of refuge. Since, as for God, his way is perfect, verse 31 says, those who trust in him can lead very sound lives that are spiritually fruitful. Here David expresses the same idea found in Psalm number one. The one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, meditating on God's word day and night, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not turn wither. To the same contrast that David makes in Psalm 28, Psalm one adds, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. It's constant comparison and contrast in the ungodly with the godly and the way God deals with both of them. On July 28, 1689, Pastor George Walker entered the pulpit to preach to the people of Derry, Ireland. It was a trying occasion since the city's 30,000 people had been besieged by Roman Catholic royalists and their troops for the previous three months, they had been under siege and their ration salvations were, were only enough for two more days. They were at their wit's end. Walker was not only the pastor there at the Derry Church, but he was also made the military commander since the previous commander had abandoned the people. In his sermon, Walker compared the plight of the people to that of the Israelites with their backs against the Red Sea. Their only recourse, he said, was to re re recommend ourselves to the cause we undertook and to the protection and care of the Almighty. Walker pointed out the strategic importance of their fortress in the struggle to restore Protestantism to Britain under the rule of their beloved King and Queen Mary and William. He recalled how God had delivered Jerusalem from the siege of Sennacherib in Isaiah 37, verses 33 through 37, and he urged them to pray for a similar miracle for themselves. Finally, he told the half-starved but believing defenders the message of King David here in verses 26 through 28, reminding them that God would not forsake those whom he trusted in. With the merciful, you show yourself mercy, merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself to be blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. You save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down, he preached to his people. Right out of 2 Samuel chapter 22. After the sermon, the weary but uplifted people, they set their eyes on the harbor and by the end of the day, their faith had been rewarded. Three Protestant ships appeared, bringing supplies and troops in order to break the siege. In addition, the so-called Protestant wind was blowing from the northeast to aid their entry into the harbor. The ships, however, had to cross a great chain while under cannon fire. Inspired by the suffering faith of the people, two of the ships dared to go against the chain finally breaking through and breaching the land. 
Pastor Walker's message in the spirit of King David was vindicated. He said in his sermon, it was always well with the seed of Jacob when they clave fast to the rock of their salvation. There is nothing too hard for the Lord when he designs to bring about his purposes. And the siege was broken. David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the words of this song so that godly people like those in Derry would be inspired to hope in their Savior during their times of desperate hours, which we all will have, have had, and maybe in the midst of even, the, even this very day. Now the fourth section of the psalm, starting in verse 32, shows how God strengthened David for salvation. You know the Prudential Insurance Company uses a picture of this massive rock of Gibraltar to symbolize its security and financial strength. But David looked to a higher source for his strength. Verse 32 and 33. For who is God? Save the Lord. And who is the rock? Save our God. God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. David's first vision of how God had saved him from verses 5 through 20 that we looked at a few weeks ago emphasized the mighty things that God did. He was speaking of he and what he has done. In this second version of the same events, David is telling what God's power enabled him to do. Now writing, I, I, David did this and so on and so forth. And so we can divide David's account into three portions Ways that God strengthened him for great feats. Ways that God intervened in his circumstances and the victory that God gave him over his enemies. First, David was able to do great things by the power he received from God. Verse 30, for by thee I have run through a troop. By my God I have leaped over a wall. And this might be talking about how David escaped from the soldiers of Saul who had surrounded him there in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 11 through 17 that you might recall. God further gave David abilities to move nimbly as he reaches, reached places of security. Verse 34, he maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. By God's power, David was able to accomplish military feats far beyond what would be considered normal. Verse 35 says, He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow, a, a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Now, Israel did not use metal bows. They didn't use bronze bows back then, which would have been too hard to pull back. You can't pull back a metal bow. Uh, they all used wooden bows back then. But what David is, is using a metaphor for superhuman feats of fighting ability. God, in addition, gave David steadfast feet. Thou hast enlarged my step unto me so that my feet did not slip, verse 37 says. So empowered by God in all these ways, David achieved, achieved numerous successes all of which bore testimony to God's saving presence in his life. Verses 40 and 41. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Then that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. David didn't take credit for his great accomplishments, but he gives praise to God who enabled him to do such great things. Christians today can similarly trust God to help them, often quoting verses such as Philippians 4.13. Most of you had it, have it committed to memory. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, when applying this verse to performing well on a test at school or being able to shoot baskets in a game, we sometimes forget the original context. Paul was referring to the victory of learning contentment in the midst of trials. Our victory doesn't take the form of slaying Philistines or, or ducking spears thrown by King Saul, but rather getting the power to say no to worldliness, finding strength from Christ to forgive our enemies, and receiving power from God for boldness in our witness of the gospel message. 
1988, a tumor appeared in the arm of a guy named Dave Dravecki. In fact, it was his left arm. He was a major league baseball player who was told that outside of a miracle, he would never pitch again due to all the muscle removed when his tumor was cut out. As a Christian, he began to pray for a miracle. And in August of that very next year, he was scheduled to pitch his comeback game. Some of you remember this. I don't care what anybody says to me, he said before the game, it was a miracle. Dorecki imagined pitching a perfect game and then standing up and giving testimony to God's saving power before the flashing lights of the media. But that's not what happened. Instead, in the sixth inning, he was throwing a fastball, a left-handed fastball, and his arm shattered right there in the middle of the game. He lay in agony on the grass, and as he was wheeled off, he remembered the words of a Christian friend who had told him that God doesn't glorify himself in the light of baseball glory, but in the darkness of the cross. Ultimately, Dave Brebecki's arm had to be amputated, and during the long treatments, he battled depression and fear and pain, as you can imagine, but he also learned there to praise God because in tribulation, he discovered God's true power for his soul. Here's what he wrote. What God does through the valleys of life is he shapes and molds us into the image that he wants us to be. He gives us strength to endure. This was Dorbecki's version of David's testimony of God's enabling him to leap walls and bend bronze bows. He never got to tell the world how happy God had made him as a superstar. He never got to talk about the miracle of his great comeback. But out of his trials, his testimony to God's faithfulness impacted literally thousands of people who heard him praise a Savior who had sustained, sustained him during his loss. And that's what God does. God not only empowered David for great things, but second, he intervened in David's circumstances. Look at verse 36. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Over and over again, David was not only personally strengthened by God, but provided with assets that he could not have received by himself. Many of these interventions came in the form of unforeseen help. You might recall Itai the Gittite, who was a recent uh, arriving mercenary captain whose loyalty to David was much needed during the time of Absalom's revolt. We study that in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Then you might recall the wise counsel of Hushai the Archite, whose counsel overthrew the wisdom of Ahithophel. Ahithophel had come up with a plan, and, and uh, uh, Hushai came with an opposing plan that they received, and that plan saved David. So David saying in verse 45, Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Those who commit to the Lord today will likewise receive help from God that they could not get from any other source. And you and I can count on that. Third, David wraps up this section with statements that describe the massive extent, the victory that God had given him. Verse 38, I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. Verse 43, skip down to that. Then that I beat them as small as the dust of the earth, I did stamp them as the mire of the street, I did spread them abroad. <clears throat> the victory that God gave to David proved the favor he was receiving from God out of God's grace. His enemies, in verse 42, looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. One commentator compares David's song to the Bayek tapestry. That, it, it pictured the events of the invasion of England under William the Conqueror in 1066. And the ladies who embroider this tapestry, if we had a full-length picture, it's about 25, 30 feet long. 
and they embroidered all of this. They, they wanted to make this tapestry famous, not only to remember the great deeds, but to inspire future generations of what could be accomplished through similar bravery. And David wants us to realize that future generations that trust in the Lord can expect similar deliverances from the Lord. He sings in verse 40, For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. And we can experience the same blessings <coughs> excuse me, by trusting in the Lord. David wrote at the end of verse 40, Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. And Christians can hear echoes in the promise, uh, uh, in the, in the promise of Jesus where he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. So having honored the Lord for being true and having celebrated the victories that God alone enabled David to have, David returns now back to his main theme of God as the rock of his salvation. You'll recall from several weeks ago, we talked about what rocks do. They, they can hide you, they can shield you from the desert heat, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And David returns back to this theme in verse 47. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. David was exalted in victory because of God's grace. So he responds by singing praise to the Lord, verses 48 through 50. Listen to him singing. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent men. Therefore, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name, which is what this whole song is all about. The theology of the books of Samuel, both First and Second Samuel, is summarized in the songs of Hannah and David that began with 1 Samuel and is ending up with 2 Samuel. You might recall, Hannah closed her song with God's faithfulness to his anointed king. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. 1 Samuel 2.10. And David concludes with God's covenant faithfulness to his throne. He is the tower of salvation for his king and showeth mercy to his anointed unto David and to his seed forevermore. So as we read David's praise, we remember God's promise to him of an eternal kingdom way back in the second Samuel chapter seven and verse 16. God promises, and thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now those who read the New Testament know that God's covenant with David and David's praise to the Lord here in chapter 22 are ultimately filled in the ministry and the reign of David's greater offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born both as the son of God and the son of David, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 says. And this is why Mary picked up on the theme of both Hannah and David's song when she rejoiced in the announcement of her virgin conception. Mary said in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 49, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low, low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. If David could praise the Lord for enabling him to leap over a wall, verse 30, and that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms, verse 35, Jesus Christ could boast of so much more. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, 
and recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. If David could rejoice singing, thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people, in verse 44, speaking of God's deliverance from Saul, Isbosheth, and Absalom, how much more could Jesus rejoice in God through his obedience to the Father before the unbelieving Pharisees and the Jewish crowd that called for his execution? Martin Luther wrote, it is beyond doubt that the wars and victories of David prefigured the passion and resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> on that fateful Friday, we celebrate how Jesus redeemed us on the cross, just as David saying in verses 48 through 49, it is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me, thou hast delivered me from the violent man. These are the words that Christ could speak from the cross. The Apostle Paul cited chapter 22 and verse 50 as explicitly fulfilling, uh, being fulfilled in Christ's triumph by the gospel. David sang, For this I will praise thee, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to thy name. David might have shined the light of God's power among the nearby nations that he conquered, but Christ has shined the greater light of God's grace. Paul wrote, Romans 15, 9, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. The book of Revelation looks even further into the future, exalting God for the full scope of the victory that Christ has gotten by his atoning death, glorious resurrection, and his mighty reign from heaven. Here's what John wrote in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. You'll recall in Exodus 33, Moses begged God to give him a glimpse of his divine glory. The Lord gave him that request, but only after putting his servant in the cleft of the rock. There Moses would be kept safe and not consumed. Not only does Jesus Christ fulfill the role of David as the anointed king who triumphs by God's power so as to establish an eternal kingdom, but by his death on the cross, Jesus is also the rock where we can be saved from the wrath of God for our sins. Therefore, when David sings, O Lord liveth and blessed be my rock, in verse 47, believers today think of Jesus, the rock in which we are saved, and on those words we can build our lives for eternal salvation. In order to enter into this rock, and be saved, we must be able to say with David, and I hope all of you tonight can say, he's my rock, he's my salvation. And then we enter into the rock. We obtain this right, this relationship by simple faith, trusting in God's word, embracing his promises, and surrendering our lives to his sovereign lordship. Then, as David said, God will show himself to be merciful, and he will deal purely with us for salvation. Verses 28 through 31 again. And the afflicted people thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. We need to be able to sing that song. If the theology of the book of Samuel is highlighted by David as God establishes his kingdom in victory and in peace, our response to this theology is also set before us by the king's song. How do we respond to the God and rock of our salvation? 
Surely it's by committing ourselves wholeheartedly to his service, experiencing with David the strength and the help that only God gives, and then lifting our hearts to give him all the glory and all the praise and the honor. We remember the great crisis of 1 Samuel when the elders demanded that God give them a worldly kingdom ruled by a king like all the other nations. We should resolve the exact opposite. O oh Lord, our rock, we need to pray, establish your rule over us and in us that we might receive your grace. William O. Cushing put it in one of his great hymns that we sing occasionally, we should take refuge in God's grace alone for the salvation we need. In the Trinity hymn, well, it's number 551, where he wrote, O oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. So sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. It's recorded that after the astonishing victory that the English had at the Battle of Angicourt in 1415, King Henry V ordered the singing of Psalm 115. Henry, and with him the entire army, fell prostrate on the ground before God, before the words were sung. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but thy name give glory. This is the spirit that we should receive from David's song of praise to the God of grace and the spirit we need to recover in churches today. Too many pastors are taking glory for themselves. Too many churches are glorifying themselves in their buildings and their programs and, and all the greatness they think that they're doing. We need to get to where King Henry V and his men were. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but thy name give the glory. As we pray that prayer, let our hearts rejoice, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, as the Lord taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 13. Because it is only God's power that gives us and sustains his gospel kingdom, and it is to his glory alone that we sing with David, the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. So I hope you received some goodness out of this poem. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I'm not the best poem guy. Uh, this is a poem and uh, hopefully you received some blessings from what David wrote in his song so many years ago. And God inspired him to do so. We have some business to take care of before we dismiss. Uh, it was brought to our attention